Now, of course, I am a child of the 1970s. I don't know if you know this or not uh, myself. I kind of like this period of the 70s because uh, I was born in 1971. So pretty much I kind of remember some of these stuff that kind of happened a little bit, especially at the, I think by the late 70s, I kind of kind of remember all that, like, you know, Jimmy Carter and all that stuff. But um, let me go ahead and first talk about Nixon, get him out the way. So a lot of stuff happened under Nixon uh, overall. They still had the Vietnam War going on. Uh, I remember my mom telling me stories about how he used to have a map on the wall in her house and showed all the areas in the big Vietnam and they're there. There was fighting going on uh, over there. Uh, Nixon, of course, took over the war uh, and he began to do different things. You know, he had won the 1968 presidential election uh, because of all the issues with the Vietnam War, uh, the protests uh, he had going on, also all the unrest, you know, after RFK, you know, Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King were, were assassinated in 1968. If you remember correctly, I talked about how Nixon had campaigned on this whole idea to end the Vietnam War, which was, you know, pretty popular. And uh, it was part of his so-called Nixon doctrine, he called it, uh, which had this thing called the Vietnamization Plan, which I think I mentioned about uh, previously at the end of my last lecture last week. Uh, and uh, Nixon, what he wanted to do uh, was he wanted to turn the war over, the Vietnam War over to the South Vietnamese. Uh, Arvin, they called it, which is the Army of uh, the Republic of Vietnam. That's what they called actually. Republic of Vietnam was actually what they called South Vietnam. They want to turn the war over to them, uh, so they fight fight the North Vietnamese themselves without our without our you know direct aid. Uh, and but we would still supply them. We'd give them all the you know military hardware you know to fight with and all that. And we would have advisors you know training them over there uh, to continue fighting you know the war against. Um, I guess the Viet Cong and, of course, the NBA, North Vietnamese Army, uh, still. And so that's actually what led to the United States eventually of drawing, you know, we're, our forces uh, over a period like something like three, four years uh, between 1969 to 1973. We began withdrawing our forces. That's kind of what we did in Iraq. If you remember correctly, in Iraq, we withdraw, our, they withdrew our forces eventually. Uh, is what we did. Uh, and then also we're doing it now. Like in Afghanistan, we're starting to withdraw our forces uh, as well, you know, pretty much. Um, now, the only problem with, uh, of course, um, is that the American public eventually heard about various incidents uh, that happened in the war, which angered a lot of people. Uh, I kind of got them right here. Uh, and uh, it led to a lot of nationwide protests anti-war protests, even involved a lot of college students, even high school students got involved in protesting the war. Uh, the three big ones were, of course, the Melee Massacre, you may have heard of, was one that came out that was pretty big. Uh, Cambodia, what I mean by Cambodia, in Cambodia, of course, the United States military started bombing Cambodia. There was even cases where we invaded into Cambodia. Um have you ever seen that movie, Apocalypse Now or something like that, which is a real good movie, kind of on that period, how they go into Cambodia and all that. And the Pentagon Papers came out also as well. Uh, so that was another issue that was, of course, big. Uh, the Melee Massacre wasn't something that happened under um, Nixon. Uh, it actually happened under, of course, uh, the end of LBJ's administration. You see, there, there's, of course, a picture of some of the people that were massacred, Vietnamese, that were killed. Uh, went, men, women, and children were all killed by American soldiers. Uh, and um, there was an incident where a bunch of American soldiers massacred a Vietnamese village. Why did they do this? Because uh, I think they suspected them of being associated with the Viet Cong. You know, communists basically helping uh, communist guerrillas and I think they were agitated because they had just killed some of their, their soldiers just previously or something like that, attacked them, and so they blamed them for it, and it led to a massacre. And I'm not sure the number exactly, but it's somewhere between anywhere from 300 up to maybe 500 uh, Vietnamese were actually murdered, like just killed, killed basically in cold blood 
men, women, and children. And um, it was actually a guy from Louisiana. I think he died in, I want to say Pineville. His name, whenever I heard it, Hugh Thompson. Hugh Thompson actually stopped the massacre because they could have killed more people. Came in with his helicopter and prevented them from really shooting them all. And um, what happened was the government and the military covered it up. Uh, and um, eventually it came out somehow. And eventually the charges were brought against about 26 soldiers that were actually involved in it. And there was one guy named Lieutenant William Calais, who I think was one of their main officers involved. He was actually convicted. He was the only guy convicted of it. Uh, but he was later pardoned. In fact, all of them were pardoned later by Richard Nixon. Uh, when he came in. So that was like the one incident that happened that was real big. Uh, then the other thing I told you that happened too uh, was that the U.S. military started bombing Cambodia. And we also tried to send, we sent military forces into Cambodia. Uh, and the reason why was because the uh, North Vietnamese were using like uh, Laos and Cambodia to, uh, infiltrate South Vietnam. Uh, they cr they've created what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which you may have heard about, which ran through Laos and Cambodia, kind of went around the DMZ, you know, between North and South Vietnam. This was a major reason why part of why we uh, ended up losing the war later, because uh, they kept infiltrating the South there, and I guess A, the Viet, Viet Cong and all that. And so, what happened was the um, people in America found out about it, uh, information about Cambodia, and so it led to a lot of mass protests uh, on campuses, like nationwide. It was like all, oh, even at LSU, Louisiana State University, I think they had a bunch of protests uh, that they had uh, against the war. And it got so bad, the protests, that they had to bring in National Guard. Uh, you know, to protect the campuses and all that from, I guess, violence breaking out. And what happened, if you know about it, it led to a bunch of uh, campus shootings where uh, the National Guard actually fired on um, students, like college students, uh, basically. Of course, the most famous was the Kent State shootings that happened in 1970 uh, in Ohio, uh, where Several students were killed and wounded. Uh, in fact, there were about four students were shot dead, and about nine were wounded. This happened on May 4th, 1970. Um, I remember there was a song they made about it called um, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. It was called Ohio. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but it's about basically about that incident that occurred. And uh, so uh, that, that happened. Uh, there was also another incident that was famous, you may have heard of, was in Mississippi at what is uh, Jackson State University, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, there was a case where uh, two of African-American students were also shot dead by National Guardsmen. Another 12 were injured because uh, they were, like I said, protesting against the Vietnam War. So this happened all over, uh, of course, the United States uh, with the protests even in fact, like high schools, like high schools, were got involved too. And you had this deal where uh, there was like a nationwide walkout where students basically uh, refused to go to class uh, and all that. Uh, most of them were peaceful, you know, except for a few here and there. Uh, this was something, like I said, that was widespread, you know, throughout the United States. Uh, they also had this other incident that happened uh, too, which was very famous, uh, of course, uh, at the end of the Vietnam War. And uh, that was the so-called Pentagon Papers came out, uh, which were leaked by uh, this guy named Daniel Ellsberg, was his name. Yeah, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, what, what, the, what the Pentagon Papers were exactly, I have to go right up here if you don't mind. But yeah, what the Pentagon Papers were, uh, they were actually um, basically this um, paper that uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, wrote. He was a military analyst for the Rand Corporation. And uh, he wrote a basic history of the Vietnam War uh, from about, uh, I think it's from 1945 to 67. Uh, and it talked about a lot of the um, secret war that was going on in Southeast Asia, which most people didn't know about. 
Uh, and uh, he talked about, you know, not just what they were doing in Vietnam, but he also talked about how America was also involved in trying to do stuff in Laos and Cambodia <laughs> as well, which people kind of got angry about. Then he also talked about Air America. I don't know if you've heard about Air America, but Air America was this CIA airline and cargo company that they had. And they was doing a lot of covert operations uh, in Southeast Asia, including, by the way, smuggling illegal drugs uh, like heroin. Uh, if you know about the whole area where Southeast Asia was for a long time, it was like the what they call the Golden Triangle. Uh, they dubbed it the uh, the area where the most heroin was produced uh, in the world. Some of you even claim that that's why they fought the Vietnam War. It was something to do with the heroin, you know, and all that that was in that area. Interesting about that. Uh, but the Pentagon Papers, which I said were released by Daniel Ellsberg, made Richard Nixon furious. He was angry about this because it was being leaked to the press uh, and all that. It was kind of harming his policies like in Southeast Asia and all that. And so one thing that Nixon was famous for uh, was he formed this thing called the Plumbers Unit or White House Plumbers, uh, it was called. And um, yeah, the White House Plumbers. Uh, and um, let me see right here. And uh, anyway, of course, this would, if you know about it, lead to the famous Watergate scandal, uh, which would follow later. Um, what was the plumber's unit? It was this special unit uh, that was created uh, to prevent leaks to the press. Uh, and involved various men uh, that were mostly, I think a lot of them were ex-FBI or CIA. You know, they were kind of in it. Uh, Gordon Liddy, E. Howard Hunt, Jim McCord, those some men that were in it. Uh, but it was like a special type of investigative unit that Nixon helped create uh, in the White House. I think somebody joked about it that, um, what are you trying to do? We're trying to stop leaks. And they say, oh, you're a plumber. Yeah, a plumber, <laughs> White House plumber. So here, of course, the name kind of stuck, you know, with that uh, more or less. Um now, what happened was, you know about this, in 1972, the plumbers, um, what they did was they did a bunch of break-ins to try to dig up dirt on people, stuff like that, especially Daniel Ellsberg. Now, Billy Ellsberg had been seeing some kind of psychiatrist in Los Angeles, so they tried to break in uh, to, to find any kind of incriminating dirt they could get on him uh, to kind of discredit him. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, and it was a kind of a really, really weird story. They broke into it and they took a picture of the whole room just to see, oh, we got to make sure we, you know, put the room back the way it was after we before we leave. Hey, they tear the whole place apart. They forget to put everything back. <laughs> These guys were ridiculous. And uh, they, they didn't find anything. Tore the whole place up. Couldn't find nothing. Uh, then, of course, what happened next, then in June of 1972, they then broke into the Democratic National Committee headquarters uh, in the now famous Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's now, I think, an office complex now. And um, evidently, uh, how they got caught, I don't know if you know much about this, but uh, as they went into the uh, different rooms in the, um, I guess, hotel looking for whatever they're looking for, uh, they took tape and they taped the doors so they wouldn't lock. And some night watchman found, found that out. And they were all arrested. Uh, and uh, apparently one of them had a black book on them of some type, which had a bunch of phone numbers in it. And they, the police later called the number. And it was the White House. <laughs> so, so anyway, all these guys that get arrested, they find out later that they're working for Nixon's committee to reelect the president, uh, which was uh, usually uh, uh, the acronym was CRP. But people would joke also. And it stood for creep, C-R-E-E-P, creep, you know, you get it. And um, really what they did was like, it didn't really help Nixon. Nixon pretty much got easily reelected in 1972. He destroyed uh, George McGovern, who was from South South Dakota. He, he just crushed him uh, in the election. I don't know why he even had to do all these break-ins. Uh, he pretty much was popular. Uh, Nixon. I think Nixon would have had a smooth second term, you know, um, and all that. 
I think McGovern only won like a couple states. That's it. And Nixon won a huge, huge landslide. Uh, but they found out about the creep, you know, the, the organization of the committee to reelect uh, the president. So apparently they'd taken some of the money, the campaign funds uh, that helped, you know, Nixon get reelected. And they used it as legal expenses to get the Watergate burglars out of jail. <laughs> it's just crazy. Can't make this up. Uh, and so, um, so that basically turns this whole burglary thing into like a political scandal uh, is basically what it does. And so what's going to happen over time is that a lot of these men that were involved in the burglary, like Liddy, Hunt, and even John and Mitchell as well, uh, would all basically be figures that would be caught up in the whole Watergate scandal. They're called the Watergate Seven. They were dubbed the ones that were indicted later. Uh, and um, what happened to cause the problem was that you're going to see later that Nixon tries to cover it up like it didn't happen. Uh, and that's what gets Nixon in real big trouble uh, because of that. Uh, what happens is um, in 1973, Sam Irvin, who's from, I think from North Carolina, he was a senator, he started an uh, investigation into this break-ins uh, that occurred at the DNC. He was a Democrat you know, a senator. And so in 1973, he formed the, what they call the Senate Watergate Committee, uh, as they called it. And uh, over time, it became a sensation, if you know about it. It was all in the news media. They talked about it. And then, of course, uh, basically uh, on all the television you know, outlets, you know, every channel, uh, they would show the drama of the hearings going on, like in your living room uh, and, and all that. So this can't, went on for months. Uh, from 1973 uh, to 74, investigating what, what happened with, you know, Watergate uh, and all that. And uh, eventually the controversy got so far that it went all the way up to, of course, the White House. And, of course, what happened was they discovered that Richard Nixon had these um, tape recordings uh, in, his, in the White House, like in the Oval Office that he had. He was actually keeping these uh, to do like his memoirs later uh, that he had. And, uh, of course, Nixon fought to, you know, prevent, you know, them being released to the public. He, he feel like it was a you know, presidential privilege to, you know, uh, information that only he should be able to be privy to, uh, basically. And eventually led to a court case, uh, United States versus Nixon in 1974. And Nixon lost. And he was forced to give up the, the so-called Nixon tapes, White House tapes, uh, as they're called. And uh, they found two tapes that were interesting. One tape, of course, had been erased. I don't know if you've heard the story about this, uh, but there was one tape where apparently about 18 and a half minutes had been erased. And um, Nixon claimed that his secretary had accidentally erased it, which is probably not true about that. And then there was another tape they found, of course, the one that they always talk about, uh, that came out in August of 1974. It was known as the Spoking Gun Tape, I think is what they usually nick nickname it, because uh, it, it's basically proof that he had you know covered up the whole thing, uh, Watergate. And what happened was they found out that what Nixon was trying to do with um, the whole Watergate scandal, he had tried to cover it up uh, by trying to get the CIA to influence the FBI to drop their investigation. Uh, and so he's kind of trying to use influence there to, to basically do that. And so that that basically proved he was guilty, you know, in covering up the whole Watergate, you know, break-ins and all that. And then so his whole political support pretty much nationwide would, would drop, not just among, you know, Democrats, but Republicans as well. You realize that, you know, that's, you know, pretty much dirty with that, with what he tried to do. Uh, then the other problem Nixon had, too, which is crazy. Nixon also, um, it's crazy, but his vice president uh, was convicted of income tax evasion. Uh, he didn't pay his taxes, uh, Spiro Agnew. Uh, and so basically uh, he was forced to resign uh, at that point. And what happened was um, Agnew was replaced by Gerald Ford. Uh, who was a represent? It was like the minority representative, I think, in the House of Representatives. He became vice president, and he's basically the only um, president 
uh, to be appointed as vice president and then become president, uh, basically. So he was the unelected president, of course, Gerald Ford, uh, which he would be, of course, later. By the way, overall, there are about 43 people that were actually convicted in the Watergate scandal. If you know about it, it became a big thing with the Washington Post. They had these two journalists uh, that were Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, which you may have heard of. They became very famous uh, for investigating uh, the Watergate scandal. And they had this informant with the FBI you may have heard of uh, that gave them a lot of information, which proved to be pretty much true. Who They called Deep Throat. <laughs> you may have heard of. Yeah, Deep Throat's real name was Mark Felt, F-E-L-T. You know, Mark Felt, who was in the FBI. And uh, that scandal, of course, proved to be, like I say, a true thing that actually happened. Um, so due to the whole impeachment, uh, what happened, Nixon was eventually forced to resign. Uh, he was the only president to actually resign. He, he would have been impeached. They were going to impeach him. He probably would have been removed, uh, well, guilty, probably by both sides, uh, Republican, Democrat. Uh, he resigned on August 8th, 1974. And uh, and then, of course, what happened, as you know, President Gerald Ford then became president, 38th president after. And, <laughs> and what's funny is Ford turned around a month later and pardoned Nixon in, in September of 1974. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's basically what happened, you know, with the whole Nixon administration. And, yeah, he really didn't have to do all that. You know, he, he, he would have won that election anyway. Uh, but, you know, I don't know that that whole Watergate break in really killed this whole uh, pretty much um, second term. All right. Then we uh, I need to move on, of course, in the 1970s and talk about next, of course, Gerald Ford. <laughs> of course, the next president that came in after Nixon resigned uh, and all that. Um, Ford, like I said, was the only president. Um, he was the first person you can see to be appointed vice president and president. It's all because of the 25th Amendment uh, that he came in. Uh, he was more known for being a football star, by the way. Uh, he played for the University of Michigan. He's from Michigan. You wonder about this. And served multiple terms in the House of Representatives. You can see he served on the Warren Commission, which is true about that. And then, of course, he was Nixon's vice president before he resigned uh, and became president. Uh, so that's a little background, of course, on Gerald Ford. Uh, Ford, of course, was known for being kind of not that intelligent. If you know the story about it, he's the one that uh, was going down the stairs of his uh, Air Force One, and he fell down. He fell down the stairs. <laughs> That's a famous story, uh, which is well known. Uh, poor guy. Um, now, um, Ford, the Ford administration went from 1974 to 1977. Uh, one of the big things that happened under Ford that was started by Nixon was detente. Detente is something they always talk about in the 70s uh, that was big. And detente was like this whole uh, re, uh, relaxation of tensions uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. It had been started by Richard Nixon um, and all of that under his administration. And at the time, uh, the Soviet Union was led by Leonid uh, Brezhnev. You heard of Brezhnev? And Brezhnev, of course, was the second longest reigning ruler of the Soviet Union. He was in power from 1964 after Khrushchev stepped down. He was in power until 1982. Uh, and uh, the period is, is characterized by several things that happened uh, under Ford that's well known. They have the SALT-1 agreements came out, which is true. They also have the Helsinki Accords, which both those I'll kind of briefly talk about uh, that happened under Ford. Uh, the SALT-1 agreement was called, of course, for short, SALT means uh, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Kind of a long name. Uh, they call it SALT for short. It was actually supposed to be a SALT too, but it never happened. Uh, and SALT one was this deal where uh, both the Soviet Union and the United States decided to limit the amount of existing ballistic missile launchers that they could have uh, on both sides. And the idea was to prevent a further arms race between between both sides because uh, at that point, even in the 70s, they thought that maybe, you know, nuclear war was still possible, which it was. Uh, so that's the first instance of where really they try to reduce 
you know, ballistic missiles on both sides. This will continue later, going up to like Reagan. They'll, they'll start to kind of do this later uh, as well. Uh, Helsinki Accords, sometimes called a, a Helsinki Agreements, uh, of course, was done in Finland, Helsinki, Finland. Uh, this was an agreement made between like different powers in the world uh, to improve international relations. It was part of the uh, idea to reduce tensions or detente, of course, throughout the world and between like the Western and the Eastern Bloc countries, uh, et cetera. And uh, part of the reason they were trying to do this uh, was they're trying to um, get the Soviet Union to open up more, uh, have more transparency, and also to uphold like civil human rights uh, and things like that uh, as another reason. So that's kind of what it was about. It was about like, you know, all states kind of having, you know, equal civil human rights in uh, nonviolent resolutions and all that could be disputed, of course, among nations, um, like with the United Nations, you know, and all that, of course, later. Uh, now, one of the worst things that happened, though, under Ford was the economy was bad. I don't know if you know much about the 70s. Uh, you know, I'm a child of the 70s and all that. But the 70s was known as a period of what they call stagflation. I have heard that term being used. Uh, but it was like the, the economy was stagnant, and there was a lot of inflation. Now, that happened, too. It's like both those happened uh, pretty much. It's part of why uh, the, uh, like, I'm a gen Generation X, you know, Gen X, Gen Xer. Uh, there's, it's a small generation. Part of why was the economy wasn't great, you know, during that time. So people had less children. You know, when you have an economic boom, people tend to have more children. Well, we, we didn't. A whole lot of kids because, you know, our generation because it was just such a poor economic period uh, and all that. So, yeah, the economy nosedive, which is true. Mass inflation, like the cost of everything went up, uh, you know, not just gasoline or whatever, but food, buying cars, everything went up. I mean, like in the early 60s, you could probably buy a car for like a three to five thousand dollars, you know, and then. I think by the time it gets to like 1980, it's getting to like 10, 10, 15,000 for a car, you know, going up. Uh, and uh, what made matters worse, they had what they call the energy crisis or oil crisis uh, that happened in the 1970s. I think it was 1973 and 1979 were the worst two years of the so called energy crisis. Uh, and uh, what happened was in a lot of Western countries, uh, the price of oil or gasoline went way up. Uh, because there's a lot of shortages of petroleum. People were just weren't producing petroleum. Uh, also, they had the Arab-Israeli wars broke out. That was another thing that really caused the price of you know oil and gas uh, to go up. Uh, in fact, here's a um, where's that picture I've got showing? Um, where is it? Um, well, this is of course the Gerald Ford administration that came in. But uh, I have a picture somewhere showing like the, the price of oil spikes. So, yeah, 73 is kind of the year where it really started going up uh, right here. You can see, yeah, at one point you could buy gasoline for nothing. You could, you know, it was, uh, it was maybe like, I don't know, 10 cents a gallon or some crazy amount uh, by buying water or something like that. So, yeah, yeah, it really, you know, didn't cost a whole lot. This happened on Jimmy Carter, too. Carter's administration, they had that problem, same problem with that uh, as well. And uh, so stagflation and all of that, of course, occurs. Um, one big event that really caused a lot of the um, energy crisis, of course, was the Yom Kippur War. I don't know if you have heard much about that war, but it was the second major war that occurred between uh, Israel, the state of Israel and the Arab states. Uh, Israel, if you know about it, in 1967 had whipped the Arab states pretty good, so-called Six-Day War. They even seized control of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, well, in 1973, Egypt retaliated with some of the Arab states, and they attacked Israel, uh, basically to try to get even with them. And what happened was the United States intervened uh, in this war directly. We had never really helped Israel directly. Uh, at this point. But Nixon, I think he was influenced by Henry Kiss Kissinger, 
uh, his secretary of state uh, decided to basically intervene. And what happened was the Arab states got mad about this, who were part of OPEC, uh, you see there. And um, they decided to put an embargo on selling you know, crude oil to the West. Uh, and so that that's what caused basically the price of you know oil and gas to skyrocket uh, pretty much. Uh, and uh, where's that picture I had showing the cars? It's kind of an old picture here, uh, but you can see the cars lying. It was actually lines just, just around the block, people trying to get uh, gas. That's how bad it was. This is in the 1973, I think you're looking at right there, maybe. Well, that's just somewhere in the 70s, I know. And uh, you can see the price of gas, 80-some cents a gallon. And that sounds cheap now, but back then, that was a lot of money uh, for gasoline when before it was going for hardly anything, like 20 cents a gallon, maybe, something like that. Uh, so, like, it quadrupled or whatever, you know. 80 cents was a lot of money back then. You could buy a lot of the dollar back in the 70s. So, yeah, that, that's basically one thing that happened, of course, under uh, Ford, which became well-known. Uh, and that is part of why later the United States tries to produce our own oil, like in Texas, off the Gulf, Gulf Coast, Louisiana. We start producing our own oil. Uh, because Alaska, uh, of course, they have got that, too, uh, which also happens. Now, of course, the other thing I want to talk about, too, that Ford did, Ford ended the whole Vietnam nightmare in 1975. Uh, and pretty much we had withdrawn our forces in 1973 uh, uh, under Nixon uh, before he resigned. Uh, however, the war kept going. We kept supporting, of course, uh, South Vietnam uh, until 1975. And, of course, the whole Vietnamization thing did not go well uh, at all. Um, and, of course, what happened was North Vietnam eventually invaded South Vietnam, and Saigon fell on April 30th, 1975. And, uh, of course, we had a lot of personnel there, civilians that were in um, South Vietnam. We had to literally evacuate them using helicopters, aircraft, uh, et cetera, to get them out. That's a very famous picture, of course. Of, uh, of course, people being evacuated from the U.S. Embassy uh, in Saigon uh, as Saigon fell uh, in 1975. That's them breaking through, the, I guess, the gates where the um, U.S. Embassy is uh, pretty much. And so, uh, yeah, we evacuated people and all that. And so that, that helped that end of the war, but it ended kind of badly, you know, the way it ended. And so all of Vietnam eventually, uh, of course, was taken over by the communist side in the war. And Vietnam was unified uh, as one state. So the whole Vietnam conflict in the end was a failure, uh, you know, from our, our perspective anyway. Now, of course, uh, what happened was Gerald Ford eventually uh, ran for uh, re-election uh, Ford uh, in 1976. Uh, and um, Ford, of course, was running uphill, uh, which he was. You know, the Watergate scandal was still kind of plaguing uh, the Republican side. And, of course, what didn't help was that Ford, I told you, had pardoned Nixon in 1974. So people didn't really like that too much. Uh, then the economy was terrible, uh, so that didn't help him either uh, as well. And the Democrats nominated a Washington outsider, some guy that had nothing to do with Washington. They were so mad. Um, it's kind of what happened with, I guess, Donald Trump, where they elected him because we were mad about some stuff. Uh, they wanted some kind of outsider to come in and take over. And so um, and it got so bad that Ford was even challenged himself. Like on the Republican side, uh, they had Ronald Reagan, who was the governor of California, uh, actually opposed him uh, in the actual Republican primaries. That's when you know it's real bad, you know, for – uh, like an incumbent when you get challenged by somebody. Uh, and so he narrowly got the nomination uh, at the RNC uh, in 19, uh, 1976. Uh, then on the other side, they had, of course, uh, a man named Jimmy Carter. Uh, you may have heard of who comes in. There's Carter who would be the 39th president uh, of the United States later. Uh, Carter was a uh, was what they call a dark horse candidate, kind of like uh, Barack Obama was 
on 2008, like a guy that was like unknown, nobody knew who he was, like outside of Illinois, like Obama, but nobody knew who Carter was either. Outside of Georgia, he was the governor of Georgia. Like, who's he? Who's that guy? Uh, and um, Carter was actually a peanut farmer. Yeah, believe it or not, he owned like peanut farms and decided to get become a politician. Uh, I think in the, I don't say in the 60s, maybe it was late 60s, maybe. And uh, so Carter wanted to become uh, like uh, get into uh, politics. And so he joined the Democratic Party. And part of why he became a politician was because of. Uh, the civil rights movement. He wanted to try and, you know, help in se uh, segregation and help out African Americans. And so that's the reason why he, you know, became a politician. And uh, anyway, uh, what happened was Carter defeated Gerald Ford in the close popular vote election. Carter received about 297 electoral votes to Ford's 240 electoral votes. And, um, I've got the slide here for it, which is right. Is that the one? Yeah, there it is in 1976. And um, interesting election in 1976. The 76 election uh, is one of the last elections where the Democrats, yeah, they won. Uh, but if you know about it, um, after 76, uh, the Democrats do not win all the southern states anymore. Uh, pretty much the so-called solid South is gone after the 76 election, because Reagan's going to come in and help solidify a lot of the southern states, so-called Reagan Democrats, I guess, all join him. Uh, and so pretty much from 1980 onward, most of the southern states, you know, will vote Republican uh, pretty much. So it's like actually the last time you see that. We're all, most of the South is all pretty much blue. So uh, anyway, um, so that's that's Carter. So let me get into, I've got a few minutes. Let me go ahead and, of course, talk about the Carter administration uh, and what were some things that happened. This is, of course, a continuation uh, of the 1970s. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But the big thing that happened under Carter, uh, of course, was uh, they had the same thing happen. So even though, you know, Carter ran all of this stuff to, you know, change the world, they still had the same problem stagflation continued into the 70s, which it did. Even I think even, I think it even went up to like early 80s uh, when Reagan came in. And uh, he was hampered with another energy crisis that happened again in 1979, uh, which I'll get to later, it was caused by the Iranian Revolution, which broke out in 1978, went to 79, and it created a drop in oil production. Uh, so that, that was another thing that happened, uh, which is true. And uh, oil prices, you know, uh, would take a while to decline, of course, again. Uh, but that would be until the 1980s uh, when that would occur. Remember, they used to have the gasoline wars and all that stuff they used to have. I remember back in the 80s when one, one gas station would lower their price. 88 cents, 89. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those days. That was funny. But anyway, um, but... um. Then, um, of course, later that it, you know they had the Gulf War, and that's what you know led the price go back up. You know, it was one of the things, of course, that would, of course, happen later. Now, Carter's big thing he did, like Jimmy Carter, that he's well known. He did a lot of stuff with the whole foreign policy, with like the Middle East. That was his big bread and butter, uh, which got him the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, by the way. And Carter's the one that got Israel and Egypt to actually. Uh, sue for peace with each other and actually have a peace treaty uh, where the two actually became friends with each other uh, diplomatically. And uh, this was part of an agreement that they made eventually called the Camp David Accords, where he, had, he invited the, uh, the the heads of state from Israel and Egypt to meet in in uh, the United States. It was called Camp David, which I think is in Maryland. They also, I think, met at the White House at one point. And um, the two sides, which were uh, Egyptian President Sadat and, of course, Israeli Prime Minister Begin, both those two eventually met. Uh, and they hammered out an agreement in September of 1978. And uh, it eventually led to the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty, signed in Washington, D.C. in March of 1979. Uh, and uh, what that treaty did, which was famous, uh, was it basically 
uh, led to Israel withdrawing its forces from the Sinai Peninsula. They gave it back uh, to Egypt, which they'd held since the Six Day War in 1967. Uh, in return, Israel was given free passage through the Suez Canal. They could send, they could, their ships could go through there. Uh, also, the Strait of Tehran, which is down there, like where the I think bottom of the Red Sea and all that. Uh, actually, yeah, they somewhere down there, somewhere uh, close to actually the Persian Gulf area, I think is where it is actually. But basically, uh, that's another thing they were allowed. Also, the Strait of Tehran uh, as well. The um, Gulf of Aqaba, I think they could sail through there uh, as well. So that was important. Um, it led to the, you know, the normalization of relations, you know, between those two countries. And you're starting to see that more today, like more countries starting to open up, like the UAE and Bahrain, a few other countries are starting to get more friendly with Israel because uh, I think they're fighting a common enemy in Iran and all that. And so that's the reason uh, for that now. But at first, it, a lot of people in the Middle East didn't like it. Uh, in fact, Islamic extremists later killed Sadat uh, because of that. They, they assassinated him. <coughs> so that's something that's true about that. Uh, one thing about Carter, which uh, some people don't like, is that Carter was the one that gave away the Panama Canal, uh, which the United States had controlled, by the way, since 1903, a long, long time ago. And so they had a bunch of um, treaties made called the uh, Torrios Carter Treaties, I think it was called, which were agreed to in 1977. Uh, these treaties basically superseded the whole Hey Bunau Varia Treaty, which originally gave us control of the Panama Canal under Teddy Roosevelt uh, in what the treaty said was that it agreed to basically give the Panama Canal to the, the nation of Panama, uh, where it is. And so that we were in our control of it, basically. Uh, and uh, we agreed to give it back to them in 1999, which would be, of course, uh, under Bill Clinton. So that's when we actually do it. And some people thought that was a bad idea, uh, what they did, what we did with that. Uh, the other thing that happened, too, was that the uh, other big event happened was the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979, uh, which touched off the so-called Soviet-Afghan War, which would last like 10 years uh, from 1979 to 1989. Uh, that war was often viewed as the Soviet Union's Vietnam War, uh, one of the conflicts that they think helped to actually cause the decline of the Soviet Union. Uh, and help in the Cold War uh, and all that. This angered, of course, the United States uh, in other countries. And so we began to support a lot of the uh, Afghan rebels over there. Uh, and it led to numerous sanctions against the Soviet Union. Uh, they even put embargoes on the Soviet Union and all that. And uh, it led to a boycott. By, the, by a bunch of the Western countries, including the United States, that refused to participate in the 1980 Summer Olympic Games. Uh, they were held in Moscow, which uh, the Soviet Union ended up winning just about all the medals because <laughs> there was like nobody else there. <laughs> yeah, it's true about that. Uh, and um, we began supporting various rebels over there in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, the most famous were the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen, you hear about them, all uh, these Islamic fighters that were fighting uh, the Soviet Union over there. And it actually included Osama bin Laden, who was from Saudi Arabia. He was actually one of these um, Mujahideen uh, leaders over there who later attacked us, you know, like 9-11. Yeah, he was actually our buddy for a while. He was on our side. Uh, and so Afghanistan becomes this um, proxy war uh, where we're sending like military aid uh, to these Afghan rebels in the Soviet unions on the other side, of course, fighting them. That's a big thing. It started under him. And this keeps going, you know, under like Reagan's administration, the whole Afghan war, which Reagan pretty much supported the whole Afghan war itself later. 
Uh, then there was one other thing I wanted to talk about with Carter, which is well known. Carter was overshadowed by the whole Iranian revolution that broke out in 1978. It practically ruined him. Uh, in fact, it pretty much was the reason why Carter lost the 1980 election to Ronald Reagan. All of those. And what happened in uh, Iran was that radicals took over the country. Like mostly, I think they're a combination of radical leftists that were secular and then people that were also Islamic extremists kind of joined hands uh, to eventually overthrow the Iranian government, which was actually a monarchy, uh, still still a kingdom, Iran at the time. And uh, the ruler of Iran was a man named Shah, the Shah. You were the Shah, Shah Muhammad Reza. I thought I had a picture of the Shah if I could find. It. I don't know if I do or not. I don't think I do, uh, the Shah. Uh, but... Um, of course, they got this guy on the left. Of course, everybody's heard of the Ayatollah. Well, he, of course, is the guy we'll talk about. Uh, he's the guy that actually would take over uh, the country uh, and create like a, uh, he created like an Islamic republic at that point. And of course, they had forced out the uh, last monarch of Iran, uh, the Shah who fled to the West. And uh, Khomeini, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, would create what is called the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and founded, I guess, in 1979. Uh, and um, he was one of the main leaders of the Iranian Revolution. He's now dead. Uh, but um, anyway, um, what made matters worse, there was an incident where apparently Iranians broke into the U.S. embassy, which was in Tehran. Uh, and it led to the famous Iranian hostage crisis uh, that occurred where 52 Americans were actually held hostage uh, by the Iranians. It lasted for over a year, uh, from 1980 uh, to 1981, for about 444 days uh, it actually took place. And it became this like standoff uh, diplomatically and politically uh, between both sides, uh, between the United States in this new country of a Republic of Iran. Uh, and you can see right there in that picture, uh, some of the guys holding hostages being held, like this guy right here, who's uh, blindfolded uh, in the middle there. And um, Carter Carter tried to make a like a military rescue uh, to try to get him out uh, and all that. Uh, and it was called Operation Eagle Claw. They were kind of, I think he tried to send in like some kind of special forces um, using, I think, helicopters and all that, and uh, it failed. I think they got caught in like a sandstorm, and uh, some of their helicopters actually were destroyed or crashed. And so the whole thing was just a total failure. They couldn't get them out. Uh, and the Iranian hostage crisis later would cause Carter to actually lose uh, the presidential election of, of 1980 because uh, of this whole issue uh, with that. Uh, so um, what happened was um, 1980, um, Carter ran for re-election against Ronald Reagan, uh, who was a conservative, by the way, and governor of California. You may have heard of, of, of Ronald Reagan. I think I've got a picture of Reagan uh, to share with you. Reagan was actually an ex-actor. He was actually kind of a B-actor. Uh, I don't think he was in too many great films. Any one of the one called the win, win one for the Gipper or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, he was also on radio. So he's like, kind of like an entertainer. Uh, they called him later the great communicator. He's a great speaker, uh, would often use a lot of humor, um, tell jokes, stuff like that. And um, anyway, uh, he had become the governor of California uh, and all that. And uh, because of that and uh, Carter's um, unpopularity uh, overall, he also had a very poor relationship with the actual Democratic leaders uh, that were like in Congress. And so because he was like an outsider, this guy came from, you know, Georgia or whatever. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of intra-party challenge. And one of the most famous things that happened, if you know about in the 1980 election, was that Ted Kennedy ran uh, against Carter, like challenged him, basically. 
Uh, and he was like the, you know, about the younger brother of John F. Kennedy and also Robert F. Kennedy, one of the surviving brothers there. Uh, but he ended up like getting the nomination, of course, uh, in the end. Now, Reagan, what Reagan campaigned on, Reagan com campaigned on uh, increasing defense spending. He believed if they could do that, that that could help defeat the Soviet Union. If they could get, you know, the Soviet Union an arms race, um, that would be effective in eventually defeating them, which actually it worked. And so that did work later, of course. Uh, implementation, 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 I can't say it. implementation of supply side economics, of course, was another thing, of course, that he did. And of course, Reagan's the one, if you know about it, that would cut taxes, like a lot of taxes, which eventually led to an economic boom later, of course, and got us out of that whole stagflation. Balanced budget uh, was also another thing uh, he also uh, ran on uh, as well. And he also promised to help to get the um, uh, Iranian hostages out, which he actually did um, when he did come in later. So pretty much uh, the dissatisfaction with, you know, Carter's administration is one of the big things that really led to why, you know, Reagan eventually won. Uh, Carter tried to paint, by the way, Reagan as this right-wing extremist, by the way. He tried to run on that, but I think because of all the problems he was having with the economy, Iran hostage thing, uh, Reagan would end up, of course, winning in a landslide uh, victory uh, in the electoral votes uh, overall. Popular vote was actually close, which is really weird uh, about it, about this election. But Reagan received the highest number of electoral votes that was ever won by a non-incumbent. Usually, but incumbent loses usually kind of a close election a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. But Reagan basically uh, received 489 electoral votes. That's a lot. That's almost like 500 range, uh, winning 44 states versus uh, Jimmy Carter, who only got 49 electoral votes. That's, that's a whip in there. So he, golly, he only got 10% of what he got. That's crazy. So it's almost like he got only like 10% of the electoral votes, you know. Uh, Reagan's vice president, by the way, would be George H.W. Bush, you know, of course, from Texas. You know him, of course, the father of George W. Bush. He, of course, was a former CIA director, uh, by the way. He was the vice president. And later he would be president after, of course, um, uh, Reagan would serve two terms as president. Uh, the thing about Reagan, which is important, Reagan is is, is the guy that kind of created this resurgence of conservatism, which is kind of around today still uh, overall uh, in Washington. They call it the Reagan Revolution uh, and all that. Uh, and so uh, Reagan um, got a lot of the you know people to want to be Republican. Uh, there's a lot of Democrats that began to support him. They were called Reagan Democrats or Blue Dog Democrats. I think they were called uh, as well. And uh, you can see there, uh, since 1955, you know, the Republicans hadn't even controlled the Senate, and that's what he did. Uh, he got enough people elected to Republicans to seize the Senate back, which he hadn't done in, uh, you can see, in 25 years, uh, more or less. So I'll get more into Reagan later um, about him. It looks like I'm just about out of time, roughly. But next time... I'll talk about Reagan. Um, so I got like up to the 1980s now. I'll, I'll get into and talk about the 1980s and probably get into the 1990s uh, as well uh, into my next lecture on Thursday and all that. And I guess if I have time, maybe I could even cover the, just kind of briefly kind of just talk about some of the modern things that happened, of course, that's going around today. Because uh, I might try to wrap up as soon as I can. I'll see if I can wrap up Thursday or not. If not, maybe next week, Tuesday. So that's pretty much it for this week. Um, uh, by the way, if you have any, um, you know, questions or, or comments about the lecture, let me know uh, through my YouTube channel. Um, you send me a comment, question, maybe you get bonus points for that uh, overall. Uh, pretty much, like I said, you don't have too many assignments left. Uh, but like I said, if you haven't turned your uh, research paper in, you need to get that to me so you can get credit for that because 
not going to have too many other big grades coming in uh, except for the final exam. Okay, so that's it for today. I'll take care, uh, and I'll see you later with another lecture. So that's it for today.